around to me. Well, good morning. Good morning. Glad to see everybody. Welcome. We're glad to have you here to another uh, Sunday morning version of, uh, of Jesus and Jeans uh, Worship at the Cottage. And uh, thank you everybody for coming uh, today. This is a, a special day. And uh, so we got, uh, we got several things that we want to share with you. Uh, even before we get started, um, just some, uh, on a sad point, uh, some sad news that we got yesterday. Uh, um, we uh, learned yesterday that uh, uh, most of you from Paradise Valley know John and Linnell uh, Coons. And uh, uh, yesterday, uh, Linnell was um, tragically killed in, a, in an accident on Highway 115. And uh, um, I, I put up, uh, I asked Jan, uh, I put some pictures up from... Uh, her Facebook page because if you're not from Paradise Valley, you you, you may see them every once in a while. Um, they were they were really with us from the very beginning of, of this, and uh, that's a picture of, of Linnell and then John and Linnell both in in happier times. And um, but uh, Linnell, uh, there was a 18 wheeler jackknife and uh, hit her head on, and uh, uh, the. The blessing out of it was in talking with Joey that it was uh, pretty much an instant uh, death. And um, so it uh, just accentuates this, this series that we're in about building community. You know, we, we gather here every week and uh, a lot of you folks know, you know, we, we come in groups. So a lot of people know a lot of people and from that group and a lot of people know. But it, it would be really cool if you, before you you leave here to, to find somebody that you don't know and introduce yourself. Uh, the verse that really came to my mind today was uh, uh, Psalm, uh, Psalm um, 90 uh, verse 12. And, and David writes in this verse, it says, So teach us to number our days. And just a, a short commentary on that. It says, you know, let's deeply consider our own family, not only our, our family of origin, but also our extended family, that, uh, that we would realize the shortness and the uncertainty of life. Linnell uh, left yesterday, and uh, the, the word I got was that she, she went over near uh, Sunita to help an elderly lady uh, spice up her room. She took her some things that she had been collecting and she went over to make someone's day. And in coming home, uh, this accident happened. And so it, it really is, that, that's why I, I say, gang, if you don't have it settled with Jesus yet, I, I want to encourage you to do that. Gosh, we, how many of us travel that road all the time? But yesterday was Linnell's day to go home. There's an old preacher story that I, I share often about a man named Enoch in the book of Genesis. And it, the Bible says that Enoch walked with the Lord and then he was no more. And part of that is, is the fact that Linnell was such a, a prayer warrior. She had such a heart for giving and helping people that uh, I was telling Bobby this morning, these are the things that we don't understand. Because if I was honest, I, I can think of a whole lot of other people, many, many people, that I would say, okay, Lord, go ahead and take them home. <laughs> you know? and, and really, not out of meanness, but just, I think they're ready. Go ahead and, and take them home. But people like Linnell, who are willing to get down on their knees and pray for situations and pray for the things that we bring up here. Those are the people we need. And although I know she's at home with the Lord and, and, and she's in the presence of God, I, I'm going to miss her ability to, to get down on her knees and pray. 
I'm going to miss her heart and her her smile, and uh, I'm going to miss everything about her. And and now John is here, and 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 we need to to really garrison around him for you folks that live in Paradise Valley. Is it's a time to bring a hedge of protection and pray for for him as well and lift him up. And so I just wanted I wanted to start with just prayer this morning. We have some other prayer requests we're going to get to, but this was one in particular that I, I just want to pray for before we even get started today. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for the life that you gave to Linnell Coons. And Father, I don't question your your timing or the fact that it was her time and that we should learn to number our days that we would gain a heart of wisdom that we would live with wisdom and be wise about everything we do every day because we never know when our time is going to come you have our days set and for Linnell it was yesterday and so we, we accept that and trust that you will do exactly righteous by her and her life and her heart and and now, Father, we pray for John, and we lift him up, God. Help us to be an encouragement to him, to garrison around him, to bring a, a hedge of protection for him, to lift him up, and to be there for him, and, and to walk with him and navigate through these very uh, difficult waters I cannot even imagine. We love you, Lord. We pray your blessings today, Father, in Jesus' name. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. We're going to do some worship. Probably very a couple of very appropriate songs. Everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. Kindness of Savior, the hope of nation. Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered. Find me all my fears and failures and fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in, and now I surrender. Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. It's mighty to save the author of salvation. He rules and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing. For the guilt of the risen King, Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, God can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Amen. Alas, and did my 
Savior bleed and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crying that I had done at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day but drops of grief can every day We're very glad to have with us our, our granddaughter, Kate, today. She's 10 years old. Stand up and let everybody see you. Oh, isn't she a pretty thing? Yeah. Enjoy Mimi. We're so glad to have her here. She, uh, she sings in the choir at her church when she goes, and uh, she's got a beautiful voice, and we'll, we'll get her up here one Sunday and let her sing. Had a, another prayer request that I just wanted to add uh, for Bev uh, Rutherford, her son David, um, uh, and I'm not going to say this right, Good, uh, Goodwin? Goodwin. 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 Um, only in his 40s and uh, had a massive heart attack. And uh, man, it's just, uh, that's tough uh, to be in the 40s. Continue to pray for, for Bobby and Dawn and talking with them the, this morning. Bobby's just, uh, what a fighter. I mean, he's just up and walking around taking steps and uh, uh, God's just doing that you know I was we were talking this morning I said God you know what what are you doing because these are the times that, that we don't understand and we don't understand why accidents and tragedies and things happen to really great people that that we need and love and uh, and support so much and again I, I think I told Bobby I said I think it's just an opportunity that God's taken to draw us deeper um, I, I never look at things that happen as uh, just a coincidence uh, the series that we're in uh, about building community is uh, it's a very important one for this this body of believers because as I, I said last week we're a little different animal than most churches or worship services and the fact that you know number one we meet here at a winery we we come from all different faiths and backgrounds and denominations and and yet God is, is doing something just uh, extraordinary. God is always doing a new thing. And uh, so 
just want to keep all of these things in prayer as we go through it. And so if you don't mind, just join me in prayer and uh, let's pray for these couple. Certainly continue to pray for Jan's dad as he's getting used to Buckhead and trying to get uh, assimilated into a new life down there. And uh, so we just pray for these things. Father, we do thank you again for the opportunity to gather together and worship you. We never take it for granted, Father, that we have this freedom and that we can come and, and lift our hearts and our, our minds, our spirits to you. We can invite your Holy Spirit into this place and, and have total freedom to be able for him to move and, and, and touch and affect our lives and, and to create life change in each one of us. I never take it for granted, God, that that's what you want to do and that's what you are doing. So we pray. We pray for Bev's son, David. We pray for Bobby and Dawn and just pray your continued blessings and healing in his life. Uh, Lord, I, I pray for the truck driver that was driving yesterday. I can't even imagine even what's going through his heart and mind. And I, I pray that he knows you, Lord. I pray that, that you would work in his life if he doesn't to draw him into a relationship with your son, Jesus. Bless our time together, Father. Bless the message today. We pray your blessings in the powerful name of your son. And all God's children say it. Amen. 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 <coughs> well, today we're going to be in the book of Colossians. And uh, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And I, I love reading it. I love studying it. And we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 14 from the message translation. And I want to read those to you today. It says this. It says, so chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, and discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense, Forgive as quickly and completely as the Master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. How, how many of you here today remember the, the old television show, Cheers? <laughs> For 11 seasons, from 1982 to 1993, Cheers was one of the highest rated shows on television. And I've offered wonder and asked you this morning, what do you, what do you think accounted for the popularity of this show? You know, inspired writing, well-drawn characters, talented actors, they all played a part. But I think that there's something more. I think that shows like Cheers or another popular show that aired later on, a show called Friends, tapped into a deep human longing for community. They both showed us people who care about each other who accepted one another in spite of their many failings and frailties and idiosyncrasies and people who shared an emotional bond, who were committed to one another. Do you remember the, the main phrase of, in the Cheers theme song? It's the place where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. <laughs> you want to be where you can see our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. The theme song from Friends said, I'll be there for you. When the rain starts to pour, I'll be there for you like I've been there before. I'll be there for you because you're there for me too. Isn't that what we all want? People who care about us. People who are glad when we show up. People who will support us and stand by us in the bad times.
People who will accept us instead of criticizing and judging us. People we can just be ourselves around. I want that. I need that. And so do you. So do all of us. Well, I've got good news for you. Actually, it's good and bad news. The bad news is this. The bad news is that Cheers and Friends and maybe some of even the, the newer television shows of, about community like The Big Bang Theory or The Office, all of those shows are pretend. They exist only on a Hollywood soundstage. And yet people love these shows. They even watch them in reruns. They, they tune in every week by the millions because they desperately want to be part of that kind of community. They see something in those characters' relationships with one another that they want. But community like that is staged. It's not real. But here's the good news. The good news is that it can be real. The good news is that there is a place where that kind of community can and does exist. And that place is here. Or at least it, it should be. Let me put it another way. That's the kind of place that the church, the, the body of Christ should be. The kind of place that it can be. And the kind of place that Jesus Christ intended His church to be. But you and I know that far too often it's just the opposite. And we have to recognize that when many people think of an accepting, loving, supportive place to be real, to just be themselves, they are more likely to think of a recovery meeting, you know, like AA or Celebrate Recovery, than a church. Last week I, I began this new series called Building Community. And, and we're going to be looking at what we can do to create and maintain community. How we can continue to be increasingly the kind of people who are unified in their love for one another and in their love for Christ. People who show their love for one another by the way they relate to one another. Not just on Sunday morning, but every single day of the week. Years ago, I was involved uh, with the local Southern Baptist Association in Charleston, South Carolina. And while I was there, I served as the, the chairman of church planning. And I, I was very excited about that because I wanted to see a new church plant becoming that kind of place where discouraged, heartbroken people find strength and healing, where confused people find help and guidance and where people weighed down with all types of sin and struggle in their life find forgiveness and relief. I long for the kind of place where lives were radically changed by the love of God flowing through His people and their relationships with one another. And guess what? God led me here to start what we do here at Jesus and Jeans. I was done with ministry. I wanted out. I love Jesus, but his children wear me out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I was. And God let me here to start this ministry, Jesus and Jeans, Worship at the cottage. Never leave that part out. And now I believe that as we become more and more that kind of place that the world will notice. And when they walk through that door, any door, pick a door, we got plenty of them. <laughs> that they will sense that something is different here. 
And when they go home, they'll say, I want that. I want that in my life. They will want what we have, and eventually we will be able to tell them that what we have isn't a what at all. It's not a philosophy. It's not a, a religious dogma. It's not a doctrine. It's not a program of self-improvement. It's not a what. It's a who. Jesus Christ living in us and through us. Jesus said in John chapter 13 verses 34 and 35, he says, A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. In John 17, Jesus said, May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You see, the most powerful argument for the truth of the gospel is not the sophistication of our theological statements. It's, it's not the historical evidence for the fact of the resurrection. The most powerful argument for the truth of the gospel is not our good works or even our, our changed lives. The most powerful argument for the truth of the gospel is our love for one another. That's what Jesus said would distinguish us among all the people on the earth as his disciples. It undergirds everything else we say. And without it, nothing else we say matters. The purpose of the church is not to produce impressive buildings or well-reasoned theological statements or inspiring worship music or well-run mission organizations. The purpose of the church is is to produce people who love God and who love one another. If we provide that kind of worship service, I believe that the angels will rejoice and I believe that the world will be to a path to our door. If not, then nothing else matters. So how can we achieve this kind of community? I have a great biblical word for you today. This is the word for the week. <laughs> the word for the week is the word forbearance. It means bearing with one another. Putting up with one another. Turning a, a blind eye and a deaf ear to one another's faults and frailties, overlooking wrongs, being patient and slow to criticize. I tell you all the time, we don't have to be twins to be brothers and sisters. There are things I'm going to like, there are things you're not going to like. There are things that I'm going to do that you don't like and things you're going to do that I'm not going to like. The scriptures have much to say to us concerning this word forbearance. For instance, in Ephesians 4, it says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. In Colossians, some of what we read from another translation says, Therefore, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love. James 5, 9 says, Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. So what does this tell us? It tells us that we will, in all likelihood, have things which we need to forbear. For all of us will at some time find our fellow beings 
to be less than ideal. And the possible grounds for such dissatisfaction with one another are absolutely endless. The way we talk, the way we think, the way we look, the way we eat, the way we interact with others, the way we take care of our house, the way we handle our finances, the way we manage our time. You could probably look around this room and pick out anybody in this room and find something about them that you find offensive, irritating, or disagreeable. <laughs> So what do we do? Do we just pretend that they aren't that way? No. Christianity is not a religion of pretending. So what do we do then? We simply choose to overlook it. We choose not to make a big deal of it. We choose to graciously tolerate one another in spite of all the things that we find less than ideal. And if that causes us tension, then we live with it. We accept that tension, that discomfort, as our problem rather than theirs. It's a choice. It's a choice that we make every week, every day, every moment that we have the opportunity to gather together, to live in a family, to connect with others outside of our, our comfort zones. So this morning, I want to give you four quick reasons for choosing acceptance in order to build community. The first is this. We choose acceptance over grumbling and gossiping. You've done it. I've done it. We've all done it. But it's a bad habit that we all share. You may not tell the person what you don't like about them or, or their situation, but you'll tell your wife, your husband, your best friends, and then everyone else you talk to. I've had people even come up to tell me when I was on the church staff, well, pastor, I have something that I would like to share with you just in, in prayer, to, something to pray for. Oftentimes I would say no. If you don't have something first-hand information, don't give me second-hand information to pray for because that's gossip. It's unkind it's divisive. It's ungodly. It's hurtful. And it stirs up contention and dissatisfaction where there was none before. I heard a story about a man who went to a priest and he confessed that the Lord had recently convicted him of gossip. He wanted to know what he could do to make it right. And the priest told him to go to the top of a mountain and to rip open a feather pillow. Turn the feathers loose in the wind, he said, and then come back the next day. So the man did like he was told. He went to the top of the mountain, he ripped open, tore open this fella feather pillow and scattered the feathers to the wind. And the next day he went back to the priest and asked what he was to do next. And the priest told him to go back and collect all the feathers. <laughs> and the man complained that it would be impossible to collect all those feathers. They were scattered everywhere. And the priest said, that, my friend, is the point. Once you begin to gossip, the words begin to spread. They scatter to the wind and they never can be retrieved. You don't know where they're going to go, where they will land, or whom they will hurt. Grumbling and gossip may make us feel better temporarily, but it doesn't build anybody up. It only tears them down. The second is that we choose acceptance over our need 
to fix them. You ever get in that mode? Yeah, well, if I can just fix them, yeah, I got, well, what you ought to do, well, what I think you should do, yeah, we just, we just want to fix them. And I used to tell people, I can't fix myself. How am I supposed to fix you? So, in, in other words, we choose not to embark on a one-man crusade or a one-woman crusade to improve those people. We, we don't take it upon ourselves to better our fellow man by continually pointing out the many ways in which they fall short of perfection. Instead, by the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we choose to treat them with compassion and kindness and patience and gentleness and love. I don't agree with everybody's lifestyle. Heck, I don't agree with my lifestyle. Thanks. There are things that I struggle with. <laughs> but I, I never try to build a relationship with someone to fix them. Now, if someone comes to you and they ask for help or advice, it's different. But even then, it's not an excuse to unload on them. Well, I've been waiting for you to ask that question. Boy, do I have a word for you. Because even then, we need to be gentle and kind. We need to listen more than we share. That's why we have two of these, one of these. Do the math. <laughs> the third reason for choosing acceptance is that we, we choose acceptance over judgment. We choose not to arrogantly set ourselves up in our minds as their judges, as if it were our right to evaluate the quality of their lives. Because that puts us in the place of God. And we never do well usurping his authority and his role as judge of the world. In Romans chapter 12, <clears throat> from the message, verses 17 through 19, it says this, Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting, getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do, do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. James 4, 11 and 12 says, Don't badmouth each other, friends. It's God's word, His message, His royal rule that takes a beating in that kind of talk. You're supposed to be honoring the message, not writing graffiti over all of it. God is in charge of deciding human destiny. Who do you think you are to meddle in the destiny of others? Romans 14, 4 says, Who are you to criticize someone else's servant? The Lord will determine whether his servant has been successful. The servant will be successful because the Lord makes him successful. I mean, wouldn't it be ridiculous if you were to go into someone else's workplace and you started walking around crit criticizing people and giving them directions? What do you think would happen? You'd get thrown out of there. Because they don't work for you. They're, they aren't accountable to you. They aren't responsible to their employer. They're, they're responsible to their employer, not you. And in the same way, we are each accountable to God for how we live our lives. In his little book, uh, Illustrations of Bible Truth, a great theologian and study pastor, study of the Bible, 
a guy by the name of H.A. Ironside. He pointed out the folly of judging others. And he related an incident in the life of a man called Bishop Potter. Bishop Potter was sailing for Europe on one of the great transatlantic ocean liners. And when he went on board, he found that another passenger was to share the cabin with him. And so after going to, to see the accommodations that he had, he came up to the purser's desk and inquired if he could leave his gold watch and other valuables in the ship's safe. He explained that, well, ordinarily he never availed himself of that privilege, but he had been to his cabin and had met the man who was to occupy the other berth. And he said, judging from his appearance, he was afraid that he might not be a very trustworthy person. And the purser accepted the responsibility for the bishop's values and, and remarked, it's all right, Bishop. I'll be very glad to take care of them for you. The other man has been up here and left his valuables <laughs> for the very same reason. <laughs> Can't judge a book by the cover, can you? You see, only God has the right and only God has the ability to properly judge. You see, we, as much as we try, we can't see the heart. We don't know what that person has been through. We don't know what struggles that they're facing. We don't know anything about most people that we know. You know why? Because when we ask people, well, how you doing? What's the answer? I'm fine. I'm fine. They have a, a new tattoo that's out. It says, I'm fine. <laughs> and underneath it, mirrored underneath it are the words save me and it's put out by the society for suicide prevention I'm fine save me we never know we do a lot of image management you know we put on these faces <laughs> Just so glad to see you. <laughs> we play that role because to be honest, to be vulnerable, you know, we think it's better to hold on to pain and, and to struggles and to things that we struggle with because we feel like we can control that. That's one of the things about our faith. You know, it's, it's not about intellectual ascent. It's about childlike faith. And when you come into a group of believers and you find people that you believe are safe and who will truly play, pray for you and join with you and, and to be vulnerable means that I have to let go of control in my life. You can't have it both ways. You can't control and you can't have faith. If you're going to control everything in your life, then you're circumventing the faith that, that you need to allow God to work in your life. You can't have it both ways. You can't have control and have faith. The fourth reason is that we choose acceptance with thanksgiving. Instead of focusing on all the things that we don't like, let's try thanking God for them. We thank God for the gifts and abilities that He's given our friends to use in ministering to others. Do you realize that God may be able to use that person that you feel weird about to reach others in ways that you 
never could? We thank God that He chose them in spite of their flaws. And that even more amazingly, He chooses us in spite of our flaws. I don't need to be here. I don't have any reason to be here. I don't have any other qualification than the little fat boy took a few courses in college and got a degree. Spent 20 years studying the Bible. Doesn't set me above anybody else. We thank God that He doesn't destroy us on the spot for our arrogance and pride in daring to judge another person. As, we, as if we deserved anything other than the wrath and condemnation ourselves. That's why I tell you all the time, what I deserve is to be in hell with a broke back. That's what I deserve. But that's not what I got. When I accepted Christ into my life, I received all of the grace that had all, was already there, that had already been offered to me. All I had to do was receive it, take ownership of it. And because of God's grace and His mercy, we can give thanks that contrary to everything that we deserve and on account of nothing good or, or worthy in ourselves, God loves us, period. He doesn't love, love us in spite of us. He loves us because He created us to be loved. God loves us and called us to Himself and made us together His sons and daughters in Christ to live forever with Him. And we thank God that the Holy Spirit is in the process of changing them and us from the inside out. He's changing us and them into creatures who someday will reflect the character of Jesus Christ. And finally, I don't know how it is with you, but with me, when we give thanks, we'll find the things that we were so upset about that we were so judgmental about, that all the, the things that we found so irritating and so objectionable, all those things will fade to insignificance. And we'll be left standing before the Father, awestruck and, and amazed that He would love, as we sang this morning, such a worm as I. There's a man named W. Philip Keller. He grew up with missionary past uh, parents in Africa. He was a shepherd. And he wrote a, a great book years ago. It was a book called A Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. And he shares the details about a, a cast down sheep and what the shepherd does to getting back on his feet. You see, when sheep lay on their back, gas begins to collect in their stomach. And it hardens the stomach and cuts off the air passages and they suffocate. And not only that, their legs go numb in, in that position. And they need, to, need a shepherd to restore them. And when a shepherd restores a, a cast down sheep, it doesn't just happen immediately. It takes time. And, and the shepherd lovingly massages the, the four legs to get some circulation back. Then he begins to talk in a, in a very reassuring tone to the sheep. You're going to make it. You're going to be okay. And then he gently turns the sheep over and he lifts it up because it cannot stand up on its own. He'll hold the animal there while the sheep begins to get some equilibrium. And the blood begins to flow in the legs and again and it, it begins to get some stability. And when the shepherd is sure that the sheep can stand on its own, 
then the shepherd will lovingly have the sheep follow him home. What a picture. <clears throat> when you're on your back and the emotional pain of guilt or grief or grudges are overwhelming you, what a joy it is to remember that the Lord is your shepherd. He lovingly comes and He comes with tender hands and reassuring words and he, he picks us up and He sets us up straight until we can get on our feet again. And then He says, okay, now follow me home. That's the message that we share with the world around us. With every person that walks through these doors. It's our mission to show that kind of love and acceptance to everyone who enters this place. In order to build community, we have to accept one another. I didn't say we have to agree with everyone. We have to accept one another. And it's my prayer that, that we'll choose, choose to do that. I want to close with a, a song that I wrote uh, several years ago. It's a song called The Jesus You Should Know. And I want you to, as I say, just think about some of the things that we talk about today. I think God gave us this series for a reason. That we have an opportunity to connect with each other and other people around us in ways that only we can do that. You think about that as I say. set us free what more could he give to show us how to live that we might know him what else could he do to prove he loves you how far could he go but to the cross who could pay Christ, the way, the truth, the light, that we might know Him. The Jesus you should know calls us to follow, to shine the light of hope on all to see, to be the voice that cries out to the darkness. The Jesus you should know is all we need. How far would you go to help the hopeless? How far could you reach to lend a hand? What else could you give to show them how to live that they might know Him? The Jesus you should know calls us to follow, to shine the light of hope for all to see. To be the voice that cries out to the darkness. The Jesus you should know is all we need. The Jesus you should know calls us to 
to follow to shine the light of hope for we're all to see to be the voice that cries out to the darkness the Jesus you should know is all we need Is all we need. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Help us to be the kind of people that love others. And sometimes even more importantly, love ourselves. Help us to look in that mirror and like what we see. And then we're able to love others as we love ourselves. We're your children, Father. I know sometimes I'm like a little hard-headed stepchild. But you love me anyway. I pray, Father, that you will strengthen our walk and strengthen our, our community together. That we might be able to live outside of these walls like Linnell. Willing to pray and be a warrior. To be able to give of ourselves to brighten someone else's day. Even if in the end it costs us our life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. All God's children said, Amen. 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 God bless y'all.